from the Catholic Underground. Today on the show, Just Call Me Captain Justice, Faith in Comic Books, Is Hell Empty? The Word on Medjugorje, Our Picks of the Week, and so much more. The Catholic Underground starts now. All righty, it's time for the Catholic Underground, which is your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 247. I'm Father Chris Decker. If you're listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on. A special welcome to those of you watching us on YouTube Live and our CUTV live stream. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He's the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Hello, Father. Hello, world. We've also got Jeff Blackwell. He's the technical director of the CU. He's commandant of the Jeff Star One Near Earth Orbiting Satellite. Hello, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here, Father. And the unseen phantom of the video. We've got Mary Kate Taylor. She's uh, in the, the, the video cave working on our live stream. So we've always known that the world is getting crazier. I mean, Jeff Blackwell is a prime example of that. You know, the world is getting crazier. And right, Jeff? Yes, and it, and I blame it on goofy drivers. But. That's well in Baton Rouge. That would be that would be correct. But now a Tennessee lawyer has pointed it out. Now, Father Ryan, the world is getting crazier, but this is this is off the charts. This is one of the great stories of our our era. <laughs> uh, defense attorney Drew Justice has a habit when he's in the 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 law court litigating a case of calling the prosecuting lawyers quote the government. So he'll say. The government accuses my client of blah, blah, blah. And so last week, the assistant district attorney took umbrance and filed a brief with the judge saying that the term the government was being used in a derogatory way. Hmm. So as any good sassy, you know, Tennessee lawyer, <laughs> uh, Drew Justice Esquire replies in one of the great legal briefs ever written. It's, it's wonderful. After all the boilerplate legalese, he says, if quote, the government is no good, then the defendant ought to be replaced as well. Because, you know, if I don't get to call them the government, they right. shouldn't be able to call me the defendant or call my client the defendant. So he suggests that the, de the defendant be called the citizen accused, Mr. or that innocent man. Point that innocent man there. I see and, what you're doing. And then so he adds that the counsel for the, quote, citizen accused, should be referred to primarily as the defender of the innocent, or, he says, if I have to, I'll accept the, the designation guardian of the realm. Oh, yes. Or even the resistance. <laughs> 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 and so, and then he, he goes over to, the, to the, the, the old, old British tradition and says, military st titles can still be applied to lawyers who are, who are actual barristers, and so he says, you could theoretically then refer to me as Captain Justice, because that's his last name. <laughs> I think and that's so, great. I would have and, to do that as the judge. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so now that he's got all this steam under him, he says he thinks that, you know, given, given the situation as it is, that if, if the brief is upheld and he's not allowed to call them the government, then he says, quote, wherefore Captain Justice, guardian of the realm and leader of the resistance, <laughs> primarily asks that the court deny the state's motion as lacking legal basis. <laughs> and so uh, what does the well, judge do? The judge says, yeah, I've got to throw the whole thing out. It's, it's insane. I mean, you know, who would you side with, the defendant or that innocent man? <laughs> I love it. And, and I wonder if, if this actually speaks to what's going on in our world today. I mean, we, we've talked about the resurgence of nominalism, right? And the, the notion of uh, our world is kind of making words what they need to be instead of what they really mean. Um, right. there, there really is something to be said about uh, the point that Captain Justice is making. No, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, you know, he, he's joking, but at the same time, it really does matter. If I'm in a jury pool... And that person looks over and says, the government yeah. is trying to send that innocent man to jail. And that here I am as the, as the leader of the resistance. Yeah. You know, that's got a dramatic emotional effect. And in fact, if we're, if we get into that mentality, that actually is going to affect the outcome because in sure. our world today, more and more, we are concerned with what things look like as opposed to what they are. Right. In fact, I was speaking with somebody the other day and we were talking about it in, in church matters and uh, how it seems to be sad that, that most, I, I would say, your average Catholic 
um, you know, Joe and Jane in the pew, are not being catechized by the homily, by the liturgy, or by catechesis or adult formation. They're being catechized by the media, you know. And, and so, when it comes to uh, abortion, when it comes to uh, so-called same-sex marriage, when it comes comes to really the church's teaching on anything that's a hot-button issue, if you were to ask them what they what they think, what they say, they'll almost always parrot something from the media because it's a very clever soundbite, and it's usually been carefully crafted by wordsmiths so that it comes across well on camera. And it seems to me that if that makes it into the courtroom, then the the notion of actually trying to stand up for something that is true becomes all the more difficult. Well, a lot of it's like what you all talked about last week when I wasn't here about, you know, well, the, the right way to understand and interpret Pope Francis's words. Right. You know, and I was listening to that that discussion after the fact and I downloaded the podcast. And the only thing that occurred to me is it doesn't matter. You yeah. know, his sound bites are so bad <laughs> that his excellent words, which are excellent. Yeah. I mean, his, his writing is or his, his speeches are beautiful. Yes. But his sound bites are so bad. That it's largely irrelevant what good he has to say. You know, if if a, if a certain sense of a pope or a bishop cannot can cannot avoid bad sound bites, it's largely irrelevant what he really wants to say. I mean, and I was reading a joke article on a website, you know, a comedy website, and they were talking about homosexuality, and it was a picture of Pope Francis saying, "See, the church now believes this is okay." Mm-hmm. You know, and then they pointed to some other author and said, "So how is this guy behind the times?" Yeah. And and that's not a, a rare belief. I mean, I talk to a lot of people every day that say, well, Catholics are okay now with gay marriage, right? I mean, the Pope said it was. Right. And and of course nothing could be farther from the truth. But if you find the right the right soundbite, if you scrub to the right version, you know, you can almost get uh, that out of somebody's mouth. And and that's that's a really sad thing. So so not only do we have to worry about our terms and make sure they're defined properly. But now in this day and age, we, we have to be careful of, of how we put those sentences together, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and, and that, that, that brings us to a, a, we really need to be careful, especially as clergy yeah. of, are we going to call it the church? Or are we going to call it our faith community? Well, yes. it's the church, yeah. you know, and, and we need to be careful. We, we need to use the words like prayer and marriage and love and truth adequately because we can't say this is your truth and my truth we right. have to yeah. we have to really embrace you know what does the mercy of god mean what does the truth of god mean and we have to be extremely cautious you know we can't just casually say something and assume that everybody means the same thing by it that's right and and i know that comes up quite a bit especially since i'm in a community that that uh, are, are very much intermarried between uh, between baptists and catholics and uh, and to be to be clear about yeah well we we say the word uh, communion, but we mean something very different by it, and and even whenever we talk about the real presence, we mean something essentially very different about that too as Catholics, and and to be very clear about that it's really uh, it's it's given me some good uh, um, kind of mental gymnastics as I prepare a homily because I have to figure out okay now how can I how can I say this. In, um, for want of a better term, in Protestant ease, and then translate it into into a, a Catholic understanding, and so it, it's made most of my homilies rather rather teaching oriented, um, but but not altogether a bad thing. And, and I think, Father, I don't know if you're finding in your homiletics that uh, that you've actually had to to be very careful about defining terms. Do you find yourself doing that? Nowadays, I really do. You know, and I have to be more and more cautious. Uh, today I preached about homosexual marriage, unnatural marriage, and I had to be extremely cautious because, you know, people are, are so easily offended. And I yeah. wanted to make sure I didn't, you know, at the end of the sermon even, I, I said, no, look, I don't want anybody to feel, you know, if you experience same-sex attraction, the church has a place for you. You have a home right. in the church. Yes. Um, you know, but it's it, it's just, it's very difficult because everybody is so hypersensitive to that soundbite culture Yes. that you say one word off and all of a sudden your entire, everything you've said is thrown out. That's right, and and of course that's nowadays why people leave one parish and go to another, is because mm-hmm. they they take one soundbite from the priest out of context and they think that the priest hates all of a certain group of people or the priest doesn't like a one certain uh, group in a parish doing this or that, and and it really can be divisive, not because the priest is 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 doing his job improperly, but because we're actually being trained by our media to listen in soundbites too. And so a great deal, perhaps, um, isn't just on the person who's speaking, but a great deal of the burden of proof is on the person who is listening as well, 
to say, okay, can I listen in such a way where I'm not letting my attention deficit get uh, overtake me, but I'm hearing what's being said rather than listening for something that I can take a little editor, a clip editor in my brain, you know, and take that and leave with it. All right. And that's why surfing is evil. <laughs> exactly. You see, there it is. So, uh, Jeff, well, does this make any sense to you? I mean, or, or are you just, I mean, you're, you're kind of a, a Jeff in the pew. And so do you find that, that uh, you're caught up in that soundbite culture as well? I was just thinking this sounds like a job for Captain Justice. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, I, am, I am with you on this, uh, Father, because um, we are, and it's, there, there was something, there was a news program, and I can't even remember which uh, network it was on, mm -hmm. but uh, it was talking about the very thing you're, you're discussing here is how the so-called mainstream media, yeah. um, the way they craft their words mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the way they they structure the sentences. It's, yeah. And I've noticed that. I mean, we've talked, we've talked about it on the show before that whenever I, I give a homily or even when I speak in public, I tend to try to, to schedule, th schedule to, to write things in small clips so that they can't be taken out of context. Like this show, for example, whenever I speak, I usually speak in, in small, I try to speak in small sentences. And that's why surfing is evil. And you know, <laughs> uh, you both know with digital editing, how people can just take and copy oh, and yeah. paste and slice and dice and make something totally out of context by rearranging the words. So, uh, And it can be very tempting uh, too, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dom Cobb over in the chat room says, it's hard to get modern notion the modern notion uh past this idea of the harm principle um modern notion of harm based on the modern on modern philosophy is very different than one based on catholic aristotelian thomistic uh, philosophy responses like it's not hurting anyone and what's the big deal mm -hmm. and that's where we find ourselves right father no absolutely i mean that that, that notion that you know it's it's as long as it's doesn't affect me personally yeah. or it doesn't affect you yeah. then why should you care about it yeah. exactly no, nothing greater than which, of course, is why uh, Captain Justice was making that point. You know? Oh, uh, and before yeah. we leave this topic, yep. I think it's worth uh, taking a look at Captain Justice's real picture. Uh, so if you'll check out the show notes for, this is uh, episode number 247 at catholicunderground.com and uh, uh, click on the, uh, the link, uh, you'll see a picture of their, uh, the, the attorney who refers to himself as Captain Justice, which he doesn't really <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, for for those Frankly, of you yeah. for those of you in our video feed, um, <laughs> Captain Justice is actually like a, a mask wouldn't be a bad thing, you know, <laughs> or some sort of cowl. I would totally wear that into the uh, to the courtroom, you know. Oh my, not a bad thing. Of course, I, I think you can wear a cowl into a into a courtroom, right? As long as you don't cover your head, you can wear a cape. Yeah, there you go. Ah, I, I'd, wear, I'd wear a full-on cape with epaulets and the whole deal. There and, you go. And the awesome thing about being a priest is a cape <laughs> is an option for us. <laughs> you know, my kids on the football field, I, I've, I've worn a, I wore a cape last week because it was just the right weather. Uh -huh. And they, I mean, everybody went, oh, wow, what's the deal? And I said, well, hi, everyone. And it was homecoming, and everyone was, well, Father, tell me about your cape. Tell me about your hat. Tell me about your cape. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> but so the then cape. I went to the homecoming game the next night in my silk cape, and they were all like, we love you, Father. This is awesome. Father, that's another cape. We weren't <laughs> it's prepared. A different cape. And they're like, this is amazing. And we I, thought about the other cape, but not this one. I put on a cape. I'd look like Nacho Libre. Uh, it's, uh, it's a scary thing. So. <laughs> that's okay. We would take you to the nearest Taco Bell, and you would get us free things. <laughs> there you go. That'd be great. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, you're listening to The Catholic Underground. We're online at catholicunderground.com. I'm Father Chris Decker. Joining us as we've always got him, Father Ryan Humphreys. Jeff Blackwell is over there in the, uh, the technical director's booth. And uh, Mary-Kate Taylor is the unseen video switcher. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, just like words and names matter... The newest version of Apple's OS X operating system is a little out of place. And, Father, I noticed this. I was the only one, I think, um, in on my block <laughs> to, to, to figure out the naming convention for, for this latest release of Apple's OS X operating system. It's Mavericks. And everybody right. was thinking, like, James Garner? Mm. You know? <laughs> no, no. Mavericks, the, the place, the, the surfing spot. And I was thinking yeah. basketball. Oh, yes. There you <laughs> go. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, but enlightenness. Like, yeah, but it turns out there's more to it, right, Father? Yeah, I mean, the, in terms of OS, we're talking about the operating system that runs Mac 
Mac laptops and Mac desktops, not the one that runs uh, iPads and iPhones. Yeah, that's its own thing. That's that's called iOS. Yeah. Um, OS 10 is is was a big big deal back in the day, and when it really yeah, I remember Father, it's what kind of dragged you to Mac, and it's what that's definitely dragged me to Mac. Yeah. Um, and I've I've continued to love it, and I've bought every OS as you know the day it's been available for the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um, and now today, they're free. What, what's that? Now it's free. Right, and that's the amazing thing is that they decided to make it free, even though they were making quite a lot of money. Yeah. You know, off of selling the iOS, they are, are the the operating system. They wanted to make it free because they they every time they upgrade the operating system, they include a, include a mountain of. Uh, new security fixes, as well as new features. Yeah. And so when uh, when a software company knows that a lot of people are going to upgrade to the new feature, then it, it gives them an incentive to upgrade their software to take advantage. And that means that Mac then can use all the new technology they learn about battery life and all this other nerd stuff. Yeah. If all the apps on your computer, your, your laptop, are using all the new nerd technologies built into the latest operating system, then you actually get those 10 hours that I get 10 hours out of my MacBook Air nice. um, of battery life. And so that's where they that's why they really want people to move forward. Also, they're doing a lot of other nerd stuff under the hood that that works toward what's called code parity, mm. where the exact same lines of code power pages on your desktop and pages on your iPad. Ooh. And that allows them to do a lot of other magic that, that makes everything sync up really nicely. And uh, so that's where they're working toward, and that's why they're really trying to get everybody to switch over to the new OS X. But it's, generally speaking, it's not something that has a lot of visual differences. There's a handful, but right. mostly it's under the under the hood stuff. And it's a really good, you know, from the nerd point of view, it's really, really big improvement. That's right. And and the thing that's interesting is is that the operating system names are always something of a of a what's coming next. And uh, Apple had a history of naming the OS 10 evolutions after large predatory cats. Is there any reason behind that that we've been able to figure out or is it just something that Steve thought up one day? I think Steve took that to the grave with him. He never mm. explained it and I've I've never I've, I've read several articles where people theorize oh, along with his dumpling recipe probably. <laughs> oh. Dumplings. The dumplings. Of course, I mean you're talking about a, a fruitarian, so they were fruit then. dumplings. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Yummy, delicious fruit dumpling. I don't know. Anyway, so predatory cats. <laughs> yes, predatory cats. <laughs> From dumplings to predatory cats, it's the Catholic underground. Yeah, yeah. So, so panther, tiger, lion, leopard. Yeah, mountain lion, snow leopard. I mean, all of them had their different improvements. Um, and Apple's kind of gotten in this habit of of doing one big improvement mm-hmm. and then one small one. Like you have, um, you know, we had lion, then we had mountain lion, then we had leopard, then we had snow leopard. And so I don't know what they'll do with Mavericks. Maybe they'll go to uh, to pipe. I don't know. But um, <laughs> other good surf spots. But that's right. This is this is. There's not a lot of gloss on the on the hood of this one, and not like iOS seven where. Tons and tons of UI stuff was changed or in user fact, interface stuff. In this fact, is mostly nerd stuff. Yeah, they took a lot of the gloss out of Mavericks. Right. Uh, which I find interesting. They did the same thing with iOS 7. Yeah, sure did. And, and In fact, Jeff, you missed the gloss, don't you? I mean, I, I, I went looking for a button that wasn't there. It's been replaced by vanilla text. I'm like, <laughs> come on. But, That's uh, right. Yeah. Well, well, Mavericks actually I find uh, is, is really good. Uh, I, would, I would give it a... Uh, a very low level yeah and not a meh because i've been pretty pleased with mavericks on on my macbook pro um i i've been afraid father to upgrade my um my mac pro the one that we edit the show on yeah i wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole if yeah. it works it works exactly mm. it, and and it only barely works because it knows that i'm crunching large bits of video oh, yeah so so other than that you've got mavericks and you like it yeah, I mean, I, I'm, it doesn't have much effect on my life. It has a very small uh, number of things that it does a little better mm-hmm. or a little worse. But I mean, and I, I do see a little bit better battery life with it. But when you're talking about 10 hours of battery life versus 10 hours and 10 minutes, you yeah. know, I mean, what are you going to do? So exactly. It, it, it has no real effect on my life, but I'm glad that I understand most of the nerd stuff that's under the hood that really is a good thing for us. So, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. And if father can break it, that's the next thing. Actually, I'm usually the one that breaks it. Yes. Well, one of the things that you can do on your MacBook Air, Father, is uh, is look at your Twitter feed. And now Twitter is a publicly traded company. The IPO happened, didn't it? It did. It happened, and it was a great success. Which I would not have expected. 
I, I would have expected uh, Twitter's IPO launch to be about like Facebook's, to be honest with you. Because yeah, Facebook for, didn't have a very good uh, uh, launch out of the gate. I think you can only describe it as an epic fail. <laughs> As yes, uh, it was because I think that they expected a a Google like um, IPO, you know, where you, you kind of jump off the diving board and before you know it, your stock's at five hundred dollars a share. Um, Facebook isn't isn't uh, faring that well. No, I mean Facebook has recovered. It was just mm -hmm. a really bad first couple of months for them. They they sold out a little high. Uh, when you when you do an IPO, you have to decide whether you want to sell a few dollars lower. Or whether you, because that's an initial public offering. Yeah. Right? So this is when you're first taking your sale of stock public, and you're going to make a huge amount of money. Um, but the way that works is the people who who are, who own the company are going to be the ones they're selling their stock in the company. Yeah. You know, so they're going to decide as a group how high or how low to sell it, and they of course have major, you know, uh, geniuses figuring that out. Yeah. And Facebook sold a little high, and then it was a complete failure, and they were trading the next day for something like half of what they had originally sold. And so nobody wanted the stock. Yeah. It was undesirable. Um, they have Twitter kind of recovered from that, from those mistakes. Yeah. And so that's the thing. Twitter, Twitter uh, kind of, they hit the sweet spot of the offering, right? Right. They were, they were a little, little low, but not significantly $26 a share. Um, I think it was valued at, at maybe a little higher mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything now is great. And the stock is trading in the uh, uh, maxed out in the fifties. Um, and is trading now, and I, I haven't checked in the last 10 minutes, but in the 40, mid 40s, high 40s. So it's, what's really, it's really looking good. So uh, what's really interesting is is that uh, there are a couple of, of reasons why it was a huge success. And, and one of the ones that I find interesting is that Twitter didn't start trading on the exchange that all the other technological companies are, are in. Right. Twitter very consciously chose to, to trade on the New York Stock Exchange as opposed to the NASDAQ. Yeah. Uh, generally, NASDAQ was considered to be the place where smaller companies could go. And so tech startups, you know, kind of set up shop there. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that apparently has been what's been done for a long time. But now uh, Twitter decides to go on New York and it turned out to be a real boon for them. Um, and I'm looking it up. And as of right now, Twitter is trading at forty one dollars and sixty five cents a share. So it's still uh, significantly up uh, from its original, um, you know, uh, statement. And uh, they've got a really good high, almost $20 billion market cap, which is a very, very strong uh, strong showing for a company that's newly trading. So it's it's really good. So their CEO is, uh, is, is rolling in the Benjamins, as it were. Oh, yeah. There were a bunch of new high-end millionaires. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, if only you could have come up with the idea for Twitter. No, not <laughs> me. Uh, I, and, and I still can't figure out Twitter. I don't know how to use it. Uh, <laughs> properly but I, I i see it you know uh, all the time being referred to on news sports yeah. just anything that's yeah, crawling across the bottom oh, of yeah. your screen yeah. and i guess maybe father ryan that is one of the reasons that twitter uh, is doing so well is because it has achieved more on-screen status than even facebook no definitely mm -hmm. it has mm -hmm. i think that's because twitter is reinvented for 10 different markets you know what i mean right. you, for some people twitter is a place to say i'm eating a cheese sandwich yeah. great for some people, Twitter is a place to syndicate the 50 other social networks they post to, Vine and Instagram and, and everything else. Right. For some people, it's just a place that you troll for curated news. Well, I, I post uh, the, on the Minor Basilica's Twitter handle uh, four to five new dar news articles a day. Yeah. And, and some people just troll those kinds of accounts where other right. people are curating their news. Um some companies are doing, you know, basic uh, kind of links. Some people are doing advertisements. Some people are doing um, deals and specials and coupons. Mm -hmm. And so everybody kind of uses Twitter for what it, what they want it to be. And so Twitter then becomes 15 different products. Right. You know, and for, for whoever needs it to be what it needs it to be. And that really makes it wildly flexible the way that Facebook never can be. Right. Facebook, yeah. you're a fan page. That's yeah. all you can be. Exactly, and you're you're kind of stuck within that that universe, uh, and of course, Twitter is really handy because you can link images to it, you can link websites to it, uh, or you can use it as a two way communications tool with uh, some of your favorite stars, or maybe news personalities, or even television shows. And so that's why Jeff, you see uh, at the bottom of a lot of screens, you see the Twitter feed rolling by. Maybe Catholic Underground one day will have a Twitter feed rolling on its video. You never know; yeah. these things could happen. By the way, did you happen to see this? Uh, and I saw it on YouTube. Uh, 
the hashtag thing with uh, Jimmy Fallon and uh, Justin Timberlake. It was no, a comic I heard bit. of it. Yeah, it was hilarious. And they but were, it was they hashtag. Were, the, uh, uh, they were seeing was, everything with the hashtag. Right, and they had right. a, a finger symbol for it too. <laughs> and of course, Father, that's one of the things that I think could really make Twitter take off in terms of a, an ad space. Is is the notion that you can then take these little short bursts of information and you hashtag them, yeah. and then you're kind of shoving them into a certain category. Right, and the idea is that that they can do a, a scan of all the content that I read, the people I follow. The things you tag. Uh, the mm. things I tag, yeah. the things I post, and the things I favorite and the things I retweet, and then build a profile of me so that they would then try to sell me uh, a, a targeted ad. And so they find a 1,000 people exactly like me, and they want to charge X numbers of dollars per 1,000, what's called a CPM, cost for per M or 1,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then they want to say, okay, and you can advertise on TV to everybody with eyes, or I can give you a thousand people who are interested in computers, music, Catholicism, and monkeys, you know, and, and, if, <laughs> and that's, 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 a, that's a valuable asset to sell to an advertiser. That's it right. Yeah. And, and that actually is one of the things that uh, I talked to a former program director of a radio station, a news talk station. And he was talking about how uh, listenership is so segmented because there are so many different likes sure. for, uh, you know, music, news, information, sports, weather, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a, uh, that, that's ingenious marketing there to be able to really target a specific market, even though it may be smaller numbers, but it's, it's valuable. Yeah. But I mean, a dollar from a small market is better than the, the zero dollars you had if you didn't try to tap it. Yeah. Or as so. my, my uncle would say, oatmeal is better than no meal. Well, that's 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 debatable. A wise man, he's not yeah. wrong. It's true. It's true. Something to eat versus nothing to eat. Yeah. Well, um, if you take in your media by means of comic book, as I know I do, um, Marvel Comics now has a new superhero, and this is a a superhero who is an evangelist of sorts, a Muslim evangelist, and and this is a really uh, interesting thing. Um, it is a, a new superheroine, uh, Kamala Khan, and she is is a Muslim, and um, she is uh, she's basically kind of going through life uh, as as many of Marvel's uh, Marvel superheroes are, uh, kind of struggling on on the personal side, but saving the earth on uh, on the public side, and uh, and so this is this is particularly striking because it's probably one of the first openly. Uh, non-Christian characters that that uh, that we we see in in comic books, and um, and it's it's a really interesting thing, um, especially because they state in the uh, the the interview about about her on um, on Patheos, the, the the Christian blog, um, that quote uh, the New York the creative team is braced for all possible reactions. I do expect some negativity. Um, which is one of the uh, one of the creators uh, interviewed in the New York Times said, um, "quote not only from people who are anti-Muslim, but people who are Muslim and might want the character portrayed in a particular light." Unquote. Uh, she also said um, another also said, "But this is not evangelism." Quote. It was really important for me to portray Kamala as someone who is struggling with her faith. Unquote. Um, the series would deal with how familial and religious edicts mesh with superheroics, which can require rules to be broken. And of course, um, that's one of the things that that usually the the superhero or heroine uh, has to deal with is well, this is what I'm supposed to do, but I want to try and and um, enact justice. Do I enact justice from a, a morally uh, correct standpoint, or do I try and go out on my own and enact justice? Um, maybe maybe Captain Justice would have something to to say to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But Father Ryan, what, what do you think of this? Uh, an evangelist who who is Muslim. Although she's not an evangelist, she's just a superhero. Right, she's just a superhero. You know, I I really don't know how to say it because I really, I'm not a comic book guy. I never have been. Um, he's but tried. I have a hard time, I have a very hard time believing um, that it is possible to have a character who's struggling with faith mm -hmm. and have that not kind of come down on the side of or against a certain religion because, yeah. you know, I mean, just like you said, you're, you're having to ask, questions and you're having to really consider and that means that you're either going to have the author fairly presenting the edicts of that faith or yeah. unfairly presenting them that's correct um, because because someone who understands rightly their faith rarely has any serious moral question 
You yeah. know, almost all moral questions come from a misunderstanding of faith. Yeah. You know, and, and Muslim faith is incredibly straightforward and simple. There is not a circumstance on the planet Earth that a well-informed Muslim doesn't already have all the tools he or she needs to make a decision. Yeah. Um, regardless of whether or not Silver Surfer, you know, got a bad <laughs> haircut and now wants to go off and destroy the giant mushroom man or whatever. Um, you know, I, I just don't, I have a very hard time believing it's possible to establish a storyline that even a superhero would, would yeah. really struggle with faith and have that not become the author either arguing for or against right. some particular faith. And that's the thing is is if the if the heroine superheroine is struggling with her faith, that's presented to the the audience. That's not something that she does in an internal speech bubble. That's a speech bubble that is that is visible to us. And and so I w- I would agree with you. In fact, um, I know with with my own little web comic that I do, Joe Catholic, one of the struggles that I'm having um, is is I'm trying to make Joe the main character struggle with his faith a little bit. But I don't want him to struggle in such a way where, uh, where he seems to be, uh, where he's making a lot of mistakes about the faith, and that's a that's that's one of my own struggles. Is is you know as a priest, I guess, and it's coming across in the character is trying to to make sure that I've always got the the right uh, expression of, of of Catholicism, and so even though I may struggle internally, um, it's something that that's happening in in my heart and and not always uh, presented to the people that I serve. And I'm trying to figure out how, in in the comic book, Joe can struggle, but at the same time, um, kind of get the job done in, in in his adventure. And that's something that that I find interesting. But you're right. In my doing that, I'm presenting his struggle to the audience, and it's always going to come down uh, on the side of trying to choose what is right, trying to choose what is what is a Catholic response. And I don't see how you could do that in any other way, especially if you're telling a story. And that's one of the things. Right. I mean, modern fiction does this a lot where a character is struggling with faith, but it yeah. almost always either comes down as evangelism for that religion or it yeah. comes down as this religion is unintelligible right. at some deep level. Right. You know, and, and even some great like Walker Percy or Graham Greene, yes. great Catholic authors, both of them end up coming down into the either the Catholic Church is obviously right or you know, the Catholic Church is unintelligible at some deep level. And that's where Graham Greene usually ends up. And, you know, I mean, neither of Graham Greene then basically just has a, a, his own himself a weak understanding of what Catholicism is. Right. You know, any priest reads that book and goes, well, duh. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not unintelligible at all. You're not even remotely understanding rightly the argument for this, that, or the other. Yeah. You know, and so if, if a faithful Muslim is going to be the author, then the thing is going to come across as a Muslim evangelical text. If someone who does not believe in the Muslim faith is the author, then it's going to come across as someone who is misunderstanding things that are obviously understood by people who are practitioners of that faith. You yeah. know, so. Well, Father Chris, yeah. you, you had mentioned uh, earlier about the audience, and that's kind of what I was wondering. Okay, so we have, a, first of all, Muslim, evangelist, yeah. female, yeah. Uh, cartoon character. Yeah. How big an audience do they anticipate having? But then, what kind of fallout and flack are they going to get because they have yeah. this uh, superhero female yeah. of the faith? Yeah. So I, I just don't know how well, how it's going to take off. Well, it's it's a Marvel title, and and uh, Marvel tends to have a really high readership, and I would imagine that folks are going to flock to this comic book for the fact that it's a new character. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps because they are interested to see exactly what we're discussing, how she's going to deal with that. I wouldn't be surprised if some pick up this comic book because they want to know what Islam teaches. You know, I mean, some say some are going to get it just for the story. Yeah. But but especially with the the spin now and and uh, the impetus yeah. of especially yeah. with everything going on in the world, right. um, they're going to be looking for some portrayal of the Islamic faith to say, okay, I know what's happening in the extreme factions. I know what's happening here and here. Mm-hmm. But what's really happening? Will this comic book be able to tell me? Right. And and a good comic book will tell you one way or the other. You know, at least from the author's perspective. There you go. Right. Um, it's worth noting that there are some Christian and Catholic characters in the uh, Marvel universe as well. And we'll no those, way. Yeah, we'll put those links in the show notes. Okay. One of the most uh, um, kind of I would say notorious, but um, one of the most <laughs> obvious is uh, if you've seen the X Men, um, Jeff uh, Nightcrawler, Kurt yeah. Wagner. Yes. Uh, is is he's Catholic? He's Eastern Catholic, and and that comes up quite a bit. 
Um, in fact, they portrayed it pretty well in the X Men movie. Um, he was, I don't remember if he was praying the rosary. Yeah, at he, some point, he should be playing a shot key. Or she, he should oh, be a shot key. Yeah, key. the uh, the Eastern Rosary, if you will. Uh, but, uh, um, but the Jesus e- prayer. But even then, you know, I mean, you end up with a clear picture of a guy who doesn't really understand his faith. Yes, and he's kind of in the superstitious. Himself. Yeah, you know. So I mean, it's you know, yeah. you you again have that same problem of of here's someone who who really hates themselves for their past sins and who is brutally. Uh, scarring his own body as some kind of weird kind of reparation. Yeah. Well, there's somebody who doesn't understand their faith. You know? Right. And nor do they understand God's mercy. <laughs> right. So, so again, and and characters. We've talked about this before in the show. Characters can do that. I mean, characters because they're fictional are allowed to struggle. Absolutely. They're they're supposed to struggle before us, and we're supposed to see those those thought balloons and those word balloons, and we're supposed to see them interact and try and figure things out. Mm-hmm. But it's it's really difficult whenever they they stop at the misunderstanding. And I would say that's true of a Muslim character as it is of a Catholic or a Christian one. And uh, and of course that's uh, that's why I think uh, it's it's important to read those things, but it's also important to read a little bit more. Uh, Dom Cobb in the chat room says, I'd like to see a modern narrative that moves a modern audience to the Catholic Church on an issue that we're not very popular on, such as fidelity or, or uh, same-sex attraction, same-sex marriage, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think um, what I would like is my webcomic to maybe be able to address some of those things, but I'm not doing that full time. Yeah. So you know how those things it are. It does take time, though. Uh, it's JoeCatholic.com. Is that correct? It's it's JoeCatholic.com. It's JoeCatholic.com. Yeah, you can read where I am so far. <laughs> That's right. I don't have a, I don't have an antiphon for it, but I do have this. See you from the Catholic underground. All righty. Is hell empty? This is a question that uh, that's not really new, but um, but it's come up on the blogosphere because of uh, a Father Barron, Father Robert Barron video, a corresponding rebuttal by um, by the folks at uh, at churchmilitant.tv, and then a little um, a little blog post by Mark Shea. And Father, the the backstory here actually doesn't begin with Father Barron. It begins with Hans Urs von Balthasar. Right, you have to go, and really it does begin before him, but yeah. Hans Urs von Balthasar is contemporary of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger slash Pope Benedict XVI, uh, and he argued in his day, this is back in the 60s and 70s, that Christians can reasonably hope that hell exists, but that it is empty. Yeah. That means that you can you can reasonably speculate that we can hope that hell is empty. Well, and the theory has been posited throughout history by various theologians, uh, and it was definitively dismissed as error, formally as heresy, by Pope Pius IX. But still, some modern pop theologians like Father Robert Barron and Mark Shea have espoused the theory and said it is, quote, acceptable speculation, meaning that they're not saying it is true, yeah. but that it is not contrary to anything in the Catholic faith to argue that it is true. Um, and now many you know, don't know how to side on the topic because the one who called out Father Barron, who has a spectacular reputation in, in the, the Catholic world, the one who called him out is Michael Voris over at churchmilitant.tv. And, you know, Michael Voris is a man who holds some very questionable opinions of his own. Mm-hmm. And so we really do have kind of a little bit of a fuzzy area. Now, the question itself is not fuzzy. Is right. hell empty? No, it is not. The church says it is not. We don't say who's there. We don't have a list somewhere. Um, but we say it is not acceptable speculation in any way, shape, or form to say that hell is, in fact, empty. And the scriptural evidence, the tradition evidence, the looking to the, the fathers of the church as well as to various uh, apparitions of saints through history tells us that hell is not empty. Yeah, like Luke 13, you know, sure. um, where, where they're talking about the, the narrow gate and the big wide gate. And, and Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, shall seek to enter and shall not be able. Um, and, and then he talks about, well, many are, are there that want to go through um, the, this uh, this wide gate, he says, enter ye in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go in through it. That's uh, that's in Matthew's gospel, 7 verse 13. So it would seem that the Lord says, yeah, um, it's there, mm-hmm. you know? And well, so, and, and I mean, how many times did Our Lady of Fatima say many, many people are going to hell, right. you know, because we're not praying the rosary, because we're not, you know... Um, doing penance, you know, and offering up our little sufferings. 
That's right. And and I guess as much as we, I think maybe the, the question comes in, we would like to hope that hell is empty because we would like to hope that um, that each person upon their, their final, ju- their personal judgment would accept the mercy of God. But, right. it, I mean, it's, it's worth saying, if a person, and this is what we believe about mortal sin, right? Is that if a person dies in the state of mortal sin, um, presumably they, they have chosen at the time of their death that they wish to be separated from God. Right. And that's if somebody, again, freely chooses mortal sin. You know, yeah. and, and every culpability that that entails. And so whenever they get to their personal judgment, uh, the, the Lord presents, you know, himself to them. And they, they be, if they are in a state of mortal sin, they're like, well, I, I don't need you. I didn't need you then. I don't need you now. And, and that's, that's really essentially what we believe is that a person in the state of mortal sin has chosen against God. And once you're judged, well, judgment is for eternity, right? Right, and you also have the the reality that if someone lives their life, uh, you know, and kind of forms their life, their life, and their entire in their entire life towards some end which is not godly, you right? Know, which is not about God, then they reach judgment, and God go, and, and Jesus reveals Himself as Lord and Master of all, yes. and they look and go, "Yeah, I'm not really interested." Exactly. Um, you right. know, I mean, because heaven, you know, heaven is not something that changes. No. Based on our opinions, it's not right. like heaven's going to be a diner for me. And it's going to be a giant art studio for you, which is sad, um, but it's it okay. Sad. But I mean, but but the reality is that you know, you so it is entirely possible to live one's entire life forming oneself, yeah, to be unhappy in heaven, right? You know, right. and so if if I spend my entire life living it all about me, yeah, then it's possible to repent at the end, yeah. but it's also entirely possible to go to judgment and say, I don't have any particular gigantic sins other than vanity, but. You know, I don't really want to go to heaven. You know, if that's right. what heaven's going to be, yeah, I'm not interested. Right. You know, and so that there's the real possibility of that as well. Exactly, and 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 that's the thing. Uh, to to we we keep death always before us, so that we also want to keep being in in the state of grace always before us too, and uh, and and I think that that's really the 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 most interesting thing uh, and the most important thing to, to focus on here is that what we do in this life, how we live our lives, uh, really does matter because it begins to form our souls for eternity. And I think about uh, that great book, Father Elijah, and, um, and even more so, the, um, the, well, there's an exorcism that takes place in Father Elijah with this, this old count who has just kind of spent his life uh, using people as objects. And he is well headed towards perdition, and he wants it. And it isn't until he has an encounter with this priest who, who is just really kind of humility incarnate uh, that he begins to turn the corner ever, ever so slightly, and and that is is really um, what I see for for the for a soul. You know that even at the moment of death, we can make the we can turn the corner. You know that's why we we hope that a priest is there to absolve our sins, etc. But um, right. but yeah, so so uh, the 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 word on it is hell is not empty because Jesus has said so. Our Lady has pretty much said so. And, uh, and so we ought to, to not want to be in that number of those who are headed in that direction. Very quickly, uh, because there was a lot of uh, news from Medjugorje this week, we want to go through it uh, a little bit. And really, Father, it's not anything that's new. No, and, and we can go through this pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, beginning in 1981, a group of young Catholics started claiming to see regular visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so these visionaries recorded many of their messages. Uh, and a lot of the messages range from ordinary calls from Our Lady for prayer, confession, the rosary, uh, to claims that are a bit more odd, like Mary's real birthday mm-hmm. is actually a month uh, separate from her birthday celebrated liturgically, and how she really wants people to throw her birthday parties, um, you know, a month early, and, yeah. and things that are a little odd. Yeah. And so from the beginning, the bishops of the Diocese of Mostar have insisted that the visionaries themselves refrain from public appearances, and they've also asked that people not visit the site. Please don't come to Medjugorje. Now, in spite of that, many, many Medjugorje groups have arisen, and there are lots and lots of pilgrimages there, and the visionaries themselves, uh, many of them have organizations and groups that fly them all over the world to speak, yeah. um, and you know they have... Uh, they, they claim to have apparitions of Our Lady all over the place. Yeah. Well, this week, Cardinal Mueller, uh, who was appointed, reappointed recently by uh, Pope Francis, published a letter indicating that the clergy and the faithful, quote, 
are not to participate in meetings, conferences, or celebrations which take the authenticity of the apparitions for granted. And and that's the real operative phrase that everybody's trying to, to wrestle with, right? Right. We so basically you don't you don't go to an event of any sort or take place with you know or a, 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 a trip or anything which assumes that these visionaries are telling the truth. You right. just don't do it. Right. And, and so um, the, the real question that seems to be coming up is, well, why all of a sudden, quote unquote, is, is the church opposed to this? And it's not so much an opposition. I mean, for, for anybody who, who has received um, um, what we would call a private revelation, you know, one of the ways that I put it to somebody today is supposed, uh, supposing that, that uh, while I was having breakfast one morning, uh, I saw an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She might have been kind of seen through the, the window in the morning sun or something like that. And perhaps she spoke to me uh, some sort of word uh, that, that brought comfort in a time of great stress. Um, it would be one thing for, for me to, to receive that as it is, uh, a private revelation, uh, a message given to me um, to, to help me along. It would be another if I told a group of people and then all of a sudden people started coming to my house so that they could look at it out of my kitchen window. You know, and and it's one thing to to remain and and allow that private revelation to to feed my soul, and even to tell other people maybe about it privately, um, to to help them maybe in their own little, uh, you know, wherever they might be. But it's another whenever these things start getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are are flocking to Medjugorje, even though the apparitions haven't been approved, and Father, they haven't ended, have they? No, and that's part of the reason that they haven't been approved is that they, they haven't ended. Yeah. There are some very questionable statements, and the visionaries themselves are not living the lives that are typically associated with visionaries. There's a lot of wealth going around. Um, there's an enormous amount of publicity, and that is, of course, in direct disobedience to the bishop. Yeah. But regardless of all these things, the, the apparitions, the claimed apparitions continue to take place. That's right. And so the church can't say, here is our definitive answer, because... You know, she hasn't. She doesn't have anything to study. Right. Well, the church can't stamp yeah. it and say this is right, and then tomorrow morning, you know, the, a visionary comes up and says you have to eat my new brand of Cheerios. Right. Um. You know, and then the church goes, "Oops." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our know, bad. That's not the way right. we work. Exactly. And so there, there is a that follows from this though. There have there has been fruit from from those who have uh, have gone to Medjugorje and have prayed there. That we certainly can't discount that. There have been fruits and, and conversions by the by the truckload. I know many priests who have come to the priesthood because of a devotion to Our Lady of Medjugorje or a miraculous event that happened to them while they were there. What do we say to them? Well, absolutely, and we say that God isn't limited. I mean, God can use anything. God could use the Holocaust. God uses yeah. all sorts of things to bring about good, and enthusiasm is a blessed thing. Right. And so we would never want to say that the, that the fruit uh, of, of Medjugorje is not a good thing. Um, at the same time, we have to be very, very cautious because the reason that the church wants to investigate things like this is because Satan can also perform what appears to be miracles. Yeah. Satan can turn a rosary gold. Yeah. Um, Satan can also play the long game, meaning that he's willing to work a few inapparent miracles and have some people come to faith if he can sow a spirit of disobedience and a kind of idolatry where people believe that if it's said at Medjugorje, it's better than the catechism or mm -hmm. more true than the catechism. Right. And so, you know, we, we ought not to say that just because there is some short-term fruit that then necessarily the long-term is going to be good as well. That's right, and we should be clear that, that we're not saying that, uh, that Medjugorje is a manifestation of Satan. We're not saying that. We're just saying that, that, manif that, that uh, investigation is important here. And, of course, uh, we as Catholics, first of all, ought to obey the Church. Right? Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's one— that is what we ought to do. That's what we're, we, sh we should do. Sir, certainly. So that means obeying the magisterium, obeying the pope, obeying the bishops, um, certainly obeying our bishops and, and what they're asking. And uh, and again, it's one thing to to have uh, to 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 go to Medjugorje as a private individual. Um, you know, th th there's nothing wrong with that. But especially for we as priests, we have an important role to play. And, and that's not uh, misguiding or misleading anybody. And, and that's really important, too. Um, of course, there are many approved Marian apparitions, right? Well, there are. There's Fatima, there's Lourdes, there's Akita, there's uh, places really all over the place where, where simple apparitions have taken place, the church has investigated, and they are approved. Now, there's still private revelation. Yes. You don't have to believe them, right. but they're there. Right. Uh, this, this message is basically saying to the faithful and to clergy, you are not to 
to assume that this that that these apparitions are real or authentic and that we should all you know humble ourselves before the lord yep. and trust that if mary's got something to say she'll say it through the ordinary channels of faith and that that we don't need you know a secondary way to communicate you know the message of the gospel that's right. Well, very good. Uh, I think that's uh, a good way to put it. Let us know what you think. Backchat at catholicunderground.com. And we're going to take a few remaining moments for the CU Pick of the Week. And for our first CU Pick of the Week, uh, let's go to Jeff. Well, I came across this quite by mistake uh, on Roku. Uh, it was a free channel. Perfect. And, uh, the name of it is called Soundworks Collection. And uh, I watched a couple of the videos. There's, uh, I call them mini documentaries. They're, they could be five to seven, 12 minutes in length. But it is so fantastic the way they, these are produced because they go into uh, in, in depth uh, uh, how sound design is, is done for particular films. In fact, there's one uh, recently that was posted about the uh, 30th anniversary of, uh, oh, heavens, that I, I just... I just uh, the name of the film slipped my mind. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and I'll come back to that. But uh, they have one for uh, the the recent release of Gravity. Yeah, uh, it is so fantastic because um, I saw it in 3D and the surround sound. Usually, that's when I why I go to a movie is because of the soundtrack. <laughs> uh, but uh, I couldn't get over how uh, the the sound was bouncing from side to side in the theater, and uh, it, it was just so incredible. I bet your well mouth done. was watering the whole oh, time. Yeah, yeah. Because typically, and maybe you've experienced the same thing with uh, if you're watching something in 5.1 or 7.1, typically the center channel dialogue is always low. And then yeah. when there's these exciting moments and sound effects are explosively loud and yeah. it just, it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, this was so well balanced and well done. But anyway, I would, uh, and uh, there's also a link where you can see this online. Uh, so it's not uh, necessarily an app or you don't have to have Roku to, to do it. But um, sound work collection. And uh, soundworkcollection.com is uh, where you can go check it out. Cool. It's, it's great. A that, lot of videos there. That'll be in our show notes at catholicunderground.com. And uh, Father Ryan, your pick of the week. Mine is wonderful and easy. Bravo Greek coffee. Oh. I love Turkish coffee, uh, and it's just one of the, my favorite things in the world to drink. And Amazon now sells Bravo, which is my favorite Ooh. personal brand. Um, you can get it for about, about $14 a pound. It's pricey, but it's pre-ground. And it is delicious, and you can make it in a in a, a sauce pot, or you can buy one of the the proper you know Turkish coffee warmers. But uh, oh, it's just delicious. So uh, nice. If you've what, never what tried it, it's it's an acquired taste. But it once you love it, you'll love it forever. Now, I, and I wanted to ask you, what is in Turkish coffee that makes it taste? Uh, it's a little funky to the me. The secret right? is cardamom, isn't it, Father? It is. Cardamom is a cardamom. spice. It's very common in, in Greek and and uh, Middle Eastern cuisine, mm. and they add that to the coffee. Also. You should remember that you're not supposed to drink the entire cup. No. You drink oh, about half, okay. and then as you get deeper, it gets thicker and grittier. <laughs> Gritty, yeah. <laughs> and you stop at a certain uh, point. Otherwise, you'll be chewing your coffee. Yeah. It's, it's actually a, uh, a Middle Eastern test of manliness, right? It'll definitely put hair on your chest. The <laughs> well, further down you drink, the more manly you are. That's right. And I can... I can I don't like to say this very much, but I can get almost down to the bottom. Yeah. Oh, my. You know? oh. Yeah. But I like the taste of cardamom. Cardamom. So maybe it's just me a mum. I don't know. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, thank you, Father, because I'm going to order some of this because I'd like to make Turkish or slash Greek coffee in, in the privacy of my own rectory because then Jeff doesn't have to smell it. Oh, it's yummy. <laughs> yeah, but be I careful. Mean, you'll stay awake for the rest of your life. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's true. There is one small caveat that you, you will be awake for a long time. All right, my pick of the week is one that I stumbled upon. Um, I follow a, a couple of Tumblr blogs, and one of the Tumblr blogs that I follow is um, is kind of How to Draw, uh, one of the art blogs that I follow. And they uh, showed a video from a YouTube user by the name of Sycra, S-Y-C-R-A, and we'll put him in, uh, in, in the show notes here. But he has a whole slew of his process uh, of, of how he draws and uh, and he shows you uh, kind of a lot of his uh, his philosophy of drawing he shows you uh, some really cool different ways to draw and one of the things that i like is he shows us some some shorthand ways to sketch out anatomy and things like that huh. so i'm really really excited i'm just get, going through some of his videos but but he and they're all here on youtube and they're for free and so really really interesting stuff 
And uh, so I recommend him, uh, a YouTube user, Cycra, and we'll make sure that that is in the show notes uh, for, for us here. Fascinating. Well, I, yeah, I, and I, I tell you, as, as much as people would say to me, oh, well, Father Chris, you know how to draw really well. You can draw anything. The, the truth of the matter is, no, uh, I can't draw anything. I can fake it pretty well, hmm. but, uh, but I'm not a trained artist. And, uh, and so I'm always looking for ways to hone my craft. Even if you look at itsjokecatholic.com and you uh-huh. look at page 1 and page 11, you'll see that there are some very marked differences because there's about, I guess, six months to a year between each page just because of the way that I've, I've uh, you know, had to put the comic together yeah. in the midst of seminary life and then moving into, uh, into moving parishes uh, every so often. And so, yeah, there, there's been that. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's my pick of the week. And of course, um, we, we know, Jeff, that there are folks who, who support us, not only by their prayer, but also uh, by, by what they do for us. Yes, in fact, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's right. And in addition to that, uh, there are so many of you who, who support us uh, by, by donation directly on our website. And so we would invite you to go over to catholicunderground.com and, and maybe give that a look. Um, we, we, have, um, we have so many of you who, who have uh, helped us in the past, and maybe your credit card has expired. Maybe it's just kind of rolled over, so uh, maybe, maybe you might want to check on that for us um, and, and see if, uh, if, again, in your discernment, our apostle is the one that, uh, that you'd like to support. So uh, that's, that's the place to do it, catholicunderground.com, and you'll find out more. Um, if you'd like uh, the show notes that accompany this episode in the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostolate, you can always do that by going to our website at catholicunderground.com. And as Jeff likes to say, whenever you want the show notes, you just have to click on the latest episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you click on the latest episode, the show notes for that episode, everything that we've talked about is going to be there. Uh, you'll also find the link to the video whenever it's finished with editing, and you'll find a link to the podcast. We're also a podcast and not just on the radio and so if you'd like to have us on your iPod or your podcatcher, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, and there are links there on, uh, on our website to do that. And, of course, uh, if you want to, you can, you can check out what we're doing on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash Catholic Underground. And we're on Twitter as well, at Cath Underground. And we'll usually let you know whenever we're having a live show uh, by putting that on Facebook or on Twitter so you can tune in into the chat room with us. And so uh, those are the ways to get in touch with us. And uh, we thank you, as always, for being such good listeners, such good viewers, and such good prayer warriors. You are our undergrounders. Well, Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It's been my distinct pleasure. Indeed. And uh, Jeff Blackwell, he is the tech director for the CU. He's the ruling despot over at the Blackwell Communications Group, which is this giant empire. Oh, yeah. You can find out more about it uh, at jeffblackwell.us and on Twitter at Jeff Blackwellus. I think uh, it, uh, yeah, thank you, Father. It's that, a pleasure. It's a privilege. Yes, indeed. And, and we thank Jeff for, for everything that he does for us. we got Mary-Kate Taylor. She is an evangelist, and in her spare time, she yields to oncoming traffic. She really does. And, of course, you know me. I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We're Catholic Underground. We're Faith Gone Digital. And we will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.